Welcome to KRQE's New Mexico News Insiders. Here's Gabrielle Burkhart and Chris McKee. Well, it's been more than two years since recreational cannabis was legalized here in New Mexico, and we have done a lot of reporting in the news about what this means, but there are major issues plaguing the industry in the state that have gone largely unreported. That is until our investigative colleague, Larry Barker, started looking into things. Yeah, and we, we know that when Larry starts digging into a story, you know something's going on. So let's introduce our guests right out of the gate here. The New Mexico Kingpin of Investigations, KRQE News 13's Larry Barker, is joining us here in the studio alongside Duke Rodriguez, CEO and president of Ultra Health, the largest licensed cannabis operator in the state of New Mexico. Larry and Duke, thank you both for joining us here. You bet. So let's start with you, Larry. Um, KRQE just aired your investigation called The Cannabis Cowboys of New Mexico, Modern Day Desperados. We'll link to that full story here in our show notes and on the post on krqe.com slash podcasts for this episode. Let's talk about what started you on the path of this story, though investigating problems within New Mexico's cannabis industry. Why was this a topic you wanted to dig into? Well, this this investigation is one of the longest that we have ever done. It started roughly one year ago, and it, it got its start really uh, based on some complaints that we were receiving from uh, people in the industry about uh, two things. The lack of enforcement by the state of this industry, and secondly, the illicit or black market cannabis here in New Mexico, the extent of it. And so he said, it's a problem. Really didn't know anything about it, but that's what sparked this investigation. A uh, Really, it's been a year since we started. Right on. Wow. And Duke, for the uninitiated, tell us a little bit about your role within the cannabis industry and your business also here in New Mexico. We are the largest cannabis licensed operator in the state. Uh, We've recently had to downsize because of a lot of the problems that Larry has brought up. But even today, we still have 35 locations. We're statewide. We're very distributed in all four corners of the state in central New Mexico, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, but you name it, we probably have a dispensary there. So, so Larry, in your report, um, we know that uh, one of the people you interviewed was Democratic State Senator Joseph Cervantes. He said in there, quote, this is not the idea I have for New Mexico. So in other words, he's kind of explaining that legalizing recreational marijuana or cannabis lawmakers were sold this idea of sort of being able to eliminate the black market by bringing this market into the light and, and getting rid of the, you know, back alley drug deals, so to speak, having more control over regulations that also comes with a legal industry. But it really sounds like based on your report, this is not what we're seeing play out. We wanted to ask why hasn't that played out in maybe just the most basic sense? I think in the most basic terms is uh, everybody was well-intentioned is, uh, 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 before recreational marijuana was legalized, uh, the transactions took place on street corners and back alleys. And the point was, let's legalize it. Let's make it public. Let's regulate the market. Let's collect the taxes on the sales. And it's a win-win situation. It's a win-win for the state in terms of revenues. And it's a, it's a win-win for the uh, for the customers. So you know what you're buying, you know that it's a safe product, you know what the potency of the product, uh, it's, let's regulate the market. The problem was they passed the law, but they didn't have the resources to regulate. And uh, today there are some 3,000 licensed cannabis outlets, it's manufacturers, producers, retail outlets, couriers, testing labs. There are nine field inspectors to inspect 3,000 licensed facilities. It's just an impossible task. So they set up the framework, a brand new industry, but they just don't have the means to regulate it. That's that's what we found in our year-long investigation. Yeah. 
One of the things that really stuck out to me, and there's a lot to unpack in your story that we'll get to, but one example is just the open drug market taking place, for example, at the El Baile Event Center in Albuquerque. Anyone can go in there, buy cannabis products of from dozens of vendors who are selling, you know, a lot of different types of products. There's edibles, vapes, candy looking products, um, but things that look too like they're marketed toward kids. And as you pointed out, you know, these products are not being tested for potency, illegal pesticides. So there's, you know, admittedly by the state a health and safety risk, but why can't anyone say, okay, this is illegal, we're shutting you down? So uh, the uh, the drug marketplace uh, that you just referenced, El Baye, is... Uh, it's just incredible. It was described to me uh, and kind of unbelievable that it could take place here. But uh, let me ask Duke first in terms, because I know that you uh, went in the facility and saw firsthand what's going on in there. But tell me about the products that you saw for sale there and what they are, but what the law says about what they were selling. So let, let's separate between cannabis and marijuana. I tend to say cannabis is the regulated market. Let's just call marijuana the unregulated market. So in this location, you're not only seeing marijuana in various forms and enticing packages to kids, but you're seeing far more. If you walk in, there's price lists for mushrooms, psychedelics, pills, fentanyl, LSD, acid, you name it. It is more than just a drug den of illegal marijuana. It's a comprehensive open market for drug dealing. Wow. And like some of the products, though, seeing the images in your story, I mean, these are like baby bottle pops, cereals. Is any part of that marketing towards children against the law? The statute is very specific. It's not intended to induce, to encourage children. It can't have cartoon figures. But everything the statute generally says you're supposed to do, that's not what's happening. So then why can't they shut them down? Um, I'll give you my opinion is because we, as Larry pointed out, we created the framework. And I think the framework has great intentions. But the fact is we didn't put the manpower and the resources to do the right things. Prior to the adult use program, we had a medical program. And there were more inspectors of the medical program when there were 35 licensees. Imagine now 3,000 licensees. Yeah. What is it? that happened there, do you feel like between, obviously the state had its hands around the medical program and was very seemingly, based on what the description that you had, uh, very serious about having the number of inspectors. They know they're gonna have to ramp up, they're gonna have to scale up when you open this thing up towards a recreational sense. Why do you think it hasn't happened? I think part of the answer is it's political. I think we were so enthusiastic about the good that could happen in New Mexico due to legalization. Remember, there's a lot of good. There's taxation, there's, there's regulation, there's economic opportunities in many of our small towns. But the challenge became so great that the state simply took off its hands off the steering wheel and just said, no more, no more guardrails, no more safety, no more inspections, just issue a license to anyone who marked the boxes. And that's what they did. You mentioned the good things here. I think one of the things people have pointed to um, is the economics of the industry. It's been touted, at least on the state side, and many officials have touted it as a success so far in New Mexico. So in March, uh, Governor Lujan Grisham even put out a press release announcing that cannabis sales in New Mexico have topped a billion dollars, saying it's a billion dollar industry. It feels like something that we should celebrate was kind of the message that you could get from reading a press release like that. That, that billion dollar industry, rather, I should say, uh, combines both adult use and medical use and sales, that figure. Duke, you've pointed out some of the problems, though, with those figures, right? It's, it's from the state side of things, it's, it's a billion dollars. But is it really a, a, a booming billion dollar business in your view? It is not. And why When not? we talk about a billion, that's the headline. When you look at the numbers, that's just the aggregate for over two years. It's not one month, it's not 12 months, it's not an annualized basis, it's an inflated number. Now keep in mind, those numbers are coming from a state agency whose primary mission they feel is to issue licenses and to tout, in fact, hyper tout, the level of program expansion. When you look at the tax data from our TRD department, it's nowhere near those numbers. 
in the other part of this, I think, too, right, is that you do have that continued illegal element. So you know that there's missed revenue, too, right? It is clear that by really reputable firms out of Colorado, other states who've done it right, we know that the potential in New Mexico's cannabis market, just cannabis, is probably $1.4 billion a year. And we see only in the regulated market less than one-third of that going through the actual system of being taxed, being regulated, being subject to inspection. So two-thirds of the actual cannabis activity in New Mexico is illicit. And part of the economics, too, as I understand it, is it is already kind of like a saturated market. Larry, you mentioned you compared the number of cannabis outlets to Starbucks, for example. Has it been a saturated market to where, you know, bringing down the price isn't really working out for a lot of those businesses? No question. We have 3,000 licensees. You're required to get a New Mexico GRT listing. Only about 300 providers a month are filing reports. So we know that a large number of them are simply just disregarding any requirements. I have mystery shop stores, and they'll walk in and they'll, take, they'll tell you the amount is $20, a rounded number, no receipt, no nothing. It is clearly ending up elsewhere than in the coffers of New Mexico. If I'm going to ask you, I feel like I know the answer to this, but if I just ask you that boilerplate question, is the state you feel like serious about collecting revenue and about looking at this industry? What do you say? I think that generally speaking, the intentions are there. Are the efforts matching those intentions? Absolutely not. I think part of our problem, and I've been a New Mexican so long, we have so much oil and gas money, we don't seem to count the importance of other revenue sources. Hmm. The process for someone in New Mexico wanting to open a cannabis shop and get licensed, you'd think, at least I thought as a consumer, it would be probably a stringent process where you have to, you know, check a lot of boxes and get inspections done, obtaining a license to operate. Um, How does the state decide who gets a license? Because Larry, in your story, as you pointed out, it's not that regulated, it seems like. It's not. It's basically... If you want a cannabis license, you fill out an application and you get the license. They issue, the state is issuing licenses really on the honor system. That is, you fill out the application and even the the head of the cannabis control division basically said, um, we, we, our anticipation, our expectation is that everybody is honest when they fill out the application. After they get their license, then they check and they verify through an inspection of the facility. And uh, if they're dishonest in their business practices, then the state can take action. The problem is the licensing process. New Mexico, we believe, is the only state in the country out of some 26, 26 states that... 32. Something like that, um, who issue cannabis licenses without inspecting the facilities. That is, they don't know if a business is compliant with state law until after they issue the license. That is very unusual. You won't see that anywhere else in the country. And then once they do find violations, it sounds like it's hard to take away that business license, right? Well, what's, what, Duke, what is the process for uh, if, uh, if a licensed facility has uh, violations of the Cannabis Control Act? Um, it depends upon the severity of licenses. So you can imagine licensures to make sure they have cameras, security cameras. They have a ca- uh, point of sale system. They're tracking from seed to sale that all the protections are in there, that product's not ending up on the shelf that hasn't been tested. So if you have, or packaging that's incorrect. If any one of those violations happen, in the old world of the medical program, it was practically grounds for suspension or removal of your license. Nowadays, it's more of a, here's a notice of contemplated action, let's discuss it, there's a cure period, and some of these things never get followed through. And the ones that actually end up with some serious consequences, it happens 12 to 18 months later. So they continue to operate out there with no real supervision. I wanted to drill in a little bit more on the inspection element of it. We talked about this earlier in our recording here that that there are nine state field inspectors with the Cannabis Control Division for the state. 
The story pointed out, though, obviously, that there's a lot more licensed facilities, 3,000 in New Mexico. But so far, from what you found, Larry, it sounds like only half of them about have been inspected. That number certainly stands out to us. Uh, What did the state have to say about the lack of inspections, and what does it mean for consumers? Well, the the Cannabis Control Division acknowledges that um, there should be an inspection of every facility at least once a year. They admit that out of the 3,000 licensed facilities, that only half have been inspected. So you can have uh, somebody who was issued a license, a cannabis license, two years ago, and an inspector hasn't ever been there. That is a big deal. The state says it's a manpower issue. They just don't have the resources to inspect every facility at least once a year. They've got hundreds and hundreds of facilities uh, licensed uh, for a long time that the inspectors have never even gotten to. And and what is the problem then on the consumer side of things when when inspectors don't get out there? Maybe you can illuminate us too here on some of that, Duke. I, I think there's a number of problems for the consumer, and probably the number one concern is safety. If these places are not being inspected, if they're not being held to a standard of making sure every product that's on the shelf is tested by a certified lab and the results are valid, and that the result and the product wasn't imported illegally from California, Oklahoma, or Oregon, all those things lead to risk. If the product doesn't have pesticides that it's not supposed to, there are a lot of problems. And not only are the problems of consumption, they're the problems of crime. It encourages misbehavior and violating and operating outside the structure. One other egregious example in your report, Larry, was the the Torrance County operation. We know former Navajo Nation presidential candidate Dine Benali had a licensed marijuana plant operation there until regulators found multiple violations, issued them a million-dollar fine. And you'd think, you know, that would put somebody out of business, a million-dollar fine. Have they paid that fine? The fine has not been collected. Uh, The state... Con- Cannabis Control Division has the authority to uh, fine licensed facilities. So uh, at the time, they had issued Mr. Benali a cannabis producer's license without an inspection. Once they did the inspection, they found uh, multiple serious violations of, of the act. They revoked the license, issued this million-dollar fine, and it has not been paid, not been collected. The state acknowledges they have the authority to issue fines. They do not have the authority to collect them. Wow. And that operation is still ongoing. As near as we can tell, uh, it is still in full operation. You know, they have some uh, 40,000 cannabis plants in production there. None of that is staying in New Mexico. It's all going somewhere, but it's not in New Mexico. We believe it is among the largest cannabis operation in New Mexico, but they are unlicensed. It is a a rogue organization. According to the state, that is a crime, fourth degree felony. We'll be right back with more of the New Mexico News Insiders. KRQE News 13 Investigations, one of the biggest cons in New Mexico history. How did they get away with it? Well, they had an accomplice, the state of New Mexico. A road rage encounter leads to murder. I miss him every single day. Did the judicial system fail here? New Mexico's families, homes, and lives are left in ashes. There's a level of anxiety. FEMA has been an abject and abysmal failure. Watch anytime on krqe.com or our YouTube channel. Can you give us some examples of what types of violations were found at that Torrance County facility? Uh, Duke, you, you've been to the facility, you toured the facility. What are some of the things that you saw there that uh, are clear violations of the, of the act? You know, I, I've heard about the location. I didn't believe it was real. I wanted to see it firsthand. And they were kind enough to show it to me. There's no question they're using pesticides that are disallowed. There's no question they have illegal environmental issues from wiring, water acquisition, 
a whole bunch of issues related. You must have adequate water before you can grow a plant. No proof of their water is their water legally. Um, safety, security, cameras, I could go on and on. It is basically a public health threat. It has everything wrong that you can have with the statute. They're probably doing it. One of the things I wanted to, to note here, Larry, you mentioned um, the belief is that all of that product is moving out of state, right? And that is something that shouldn't be happening, right? Uh, with uh, cannabis grows, they're supposed to be growing product that stays within the bounds of the state. Am I right in that? There's no question that New Mexico has a black eye right now. It's viewed as the most lax state when it comes to the production of cannabis. If you want to produce product, you want to ship it outside of New Mexico, you're going to choose New Mexico for where you're going to conduct your activities. Cannabis produced in New Mexico must be sold and marketed in New Mexico only? Product cannot cross state lines. Absolutely. That would be that would be basically a federal crime. Yeah, that's where the feds get involved is that, that uh, interstate commerce, as we often hear that phrase. Um, we've pointed out the state can issue those large fines, but they don't have the authority to forcibly collect them. I wanted to ask you, Duke, what does that say about the licensed, or what does that say rather to the licensed operators who are working hard to stay up with the rules and follow the regulations? So imagine, as Larry described, there's 3,000 plus licensees. What about the three, the four, the 10,000 that are operating unlicensed? Because they've clearly recognized you're not supervising, you're not regulating, you're not enforcing the licensees, so I can go ahead and blend into the crowd and be another one. You have smoke shops today in Albuquerque and throughout this state that are nothing more than unlicensed dispensaries. You have grows and farms that are, as Larry described, that's just one location. I'd argue there's dozens more just like the one you mentioned. So they're able to blend in if they know there's no enforcement. Police can't determine what's real and what's not anymore. And we're just creating this overly illegal, illicit black market. What's the messaging, though, to the businesses who are trying really hard to be legal about everything they're doing? The difficult thing is the messaging, as you described, because there are not illicit dry cleaners. There's not illicit bagel shops, but there are illicit cannabis operators. And so what the message is, I'll just stop paying my gross receipts tax. I'll stop paying my cannabis excise tax. I won't pay the state, the Fed, and I'll operate under the table. You know when things get more desperate, then I'm going to go ahead and deal in mushrooms. I'm going to go ahead and deal in fentanyl. I may deal in illicit guns and in children. You create an environment of lawlessness. Will Glasby, he was another person in your story. He ha heads up the federal drug program that provides resources to local law enforcement. And he said in your report, Larry, that this legalization has made it more difficult for law enforcement investigations into these illicit operations. It's provided some cover for Mexican drug cartels and Chinese organized crimes to carry out illegal activities that you said in your report. Can you explain a little bit more about that international connection? Sure. Uh, there, according to uh, law enforcement experts, individuals who have uh, uh, who are actively involved in uh, investigating uh, drug crimes, they say that there is evidence that the uh, the cartels have moved into New Mexico and are involved in the cannabis industry, as well as Chinese organized crime organizations. We can tell you, and this is based on our investigation, just in Torrance County alone, we found seven, at least seven, large-scale cannabis plantations which are owned and run by individuals from mainland China. Wow. Some of them are licensed, some have had their licenses revoked, and some are unlicensed. Is law enforcement doing anything about those operations? Not to date. Now, uh, I, I say not to date, uh, not that... Uh, not that we know. We are unaware of any arrests, any, uh, uh, nobody's been shut down. Um, uh, 
we do understand that there are a number of investigations, both on the state and federal level. But to date, uh, there has been no uh, law enforcement activity uh, aimed at uh, these illicit uh, cannabis operations. So ultimately, we know it's still a relatively new industry just a few years down the road, um, and marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. It's considered a Schedule One drug. It's the same level as heroin and LSD, among others, and, and the feds basically say Schedule One drugs, quote, have no current accepted medical use and a high potential of abuse. Again, that's federal uh, descriptors on Schedule One drugs. Duke, we've mentioned problems about the industry before, but what do you think needs to happen in New Mexico for the cannabis industry to be a successful endeavor in this state? Can it be a successful endeavor? I think cannabis provides great opportunity for the state of New Mexico. It should. The problem is, is can we stuff the genie back in the bottle? Um, That's going to be a tough challenge. There has to be a real commitment to stepping up enforcement, providing resources for, for, for real penalties, for statutes that recognize if you were to drive through the city of Albuquerque with a semi-load full of 100,000 pounds of illegal cannabis, the most you're going to get charged with is a misdemeanor. That, that doesn't work. So you've got to get law enforcement to realize and, and, and accept the responsibility that there are greater challenges with illegal cannabis. It affects fentanyl. It affects kids. It affects all every other crime we're seeing throughout our city and state. But right now they feel like there just aren't penalties there to make it worth my time and effort. So the number one focus has got to create a new framework, a stronger, more rigid, enforceable framework that we can actually get out the bad operators. Yeah. Is somebody... Um, you know, just in news, we hear the general thread of business and regulation. And there are a lot of other businesses and other sectors that say government red tape, there's too much. You know, we always hear that narrative. Uh, as, as a, you know, cannabis producer and retailer, you know, what do you see? Do you want more regulatory framework that could hamstring your own business? Or, or is, you know what I mean? It's, there's a, I guess there seems like there may be a balance here that maybe you're looking for and you just don't feel like that there's enough regulation that's happening. We want a framework that protects consumers, has public safety built into it, that tests products and makes sure that unsafe products are not on the shelf, that products that entice children are not on the shelf. We want accountability, that every transaction gets treated equally. If you do those kinds of things, we create a level playing field. I don't mind personally for Ultra Health and for the company that we are, as long as the rules are the same. But when you're seeing 34 original licensees from the old medical program in the first two years, half of them are gone. And why'd they go away? Because they're competing next door neighbor who has no license, who's not paying taxes, who's not following the rule, who's growing thousands of illicit plants. It's near impossible to compete if we don't create that level playing field for everyone. So it's not more about more regulation. It's about equal enforcement of regulation. Larry, is there anything particularly, you said this was one of your longest investigations, anything that stood out to you in just learning more about the cannabis industry, how it operates, and something you want, you know, listeners to take away from your story or or this conversation? I think what really, uh, what I found shocking and and there's it's got to be pretty bad for for me to find something shocking but i got to tell you the extent of the black market the illicit cannabis grown in new mexico the just the in terms of money dollars and lost revenue to the state of new mexico is staggering and that really that really struck me um, you know, uh, maybe Duke, you can put this in, in, in terms of, uh, dollars, but what is the black market, uh, cannabis mean to New Mexicans? What does that mean? It would mean that there is somewhere near a billion dollars a year of untaxed economic activity that's not going through legitimate storefronts that's not being paying payroll tax, that's not creating jobs, that's not flowing through the economy illegally, that is most likely being diverted 
going to illegal enterprises like cartels, is going to fund human trafficking. It's not being accounted for. So you can only imagine how many bad places those dollars are being turned over into. To boil it all down, you know, if I'm someone out there in New Mexico who doesn't buy or use cannabis or, um, you know, someone who's not involved in the industry, why should I care about all of this and that what's going on in the black market? What, what effect does this problem have on everyone else? I have two granddaughters here in Albuquerque. And they're impacted just as much as anyone else's kids. The reason why, they can walk into that drug den at Morningside and Central. They can be impacted by illicit operators. They can be sold alternatives, inappropriate, unsafe products. The fact is, every time we allow these things to happen, our communities deteriorate one more bit. And then ultimately, someone has to pay the price, and it's usually not a good number. Mm -hmm. Larry, any, any closing thoughts, anything you'd like to add? You know, this is a big deal. We spent a year on this investigation because of the incredible impact on the state. When the problem first came to my attention a year ago, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's a cannabis industry. The state has legalized it. Why spend much time on this? But the more we looked, every time we looked at something, we turned a corner and we came up with some, another problem. And it, it is the impact on New Mexico is huge. That's why we spent so much time on it. This is not just a cannabis problem. It is a crime issue. It's an economic issue to the state of New Mexico. This is something that people really need to pay attention to. We'll be right back with more on New Mexico News Insiders. Hi, I'm Ann Perret, an investigative reporter in our KRQE Investigates unit. We are always working on something new right after it airs on KRQE. You can always find it on our website, krqe.com, or the next day on our KRQE YouTube channel. And now back to the New Mexico News Insiders. Thanks again to Larry Barker and Duke Rodriguez for that extended conversation about all the problems with New Mexico's black market cannabis industry. You know, it sounds like, as Larry pointed out, this is something that lawmakers and the governor really should pay close attention to. Um, Duke also mentioned just in the last week, two legacy operators told him that they're calling it quits. And, you know, he expressed to us some uh, worry that if there aren't major reforms in the industry, there will be more legitimate businesses who will just throw up their hands. Yeah, it is fascinating to me because it's obviously something the state wanted, but yet here we are and there are numerous problems with regulation and just um, how the state is going to get out of that seems to be a really big question mark that uh, seemingly there are no answers for at this point. Or resources. So, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story we'll keep paying attention to. We appreciate you joining us here for this episode of New Mexico News Insiders. If you're watching on Fox New Mexico, that's where we air now at 1035 on Wednesdays, uh, you can watch the entire extended conversation on krqe.com and also our KRQE YouTube page, or you can listen in any of the podcast players that we originally have started in as we've branched out into now more video. And if you have ideas, let us know. I'm at chris.mckee at krqe.com, also at Chris McKee TV. And I'm gabrielle.burkhardt at krqe.com via email and gburknm on social media. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>